praise the Lord for the worship team. That was just powerful, powerful. Yeah, I'll thank the Lord for the worship team. Those of you that aren't thankful for the worship team, you must have been in church that always had plenty of worship team. <laughs> but I remember the day we worshiped with, uh, with uh, DVDs. And uh, thank the Lord so much for live worship and ability for our worship leaders to flow with the Holy Spirit. And so I really appreciate them. Uh, well, <coughs> hallelujah. It's been a good morning already. But I want to talk to you about this morning about a, um, the title of the message is Who's Your Daddy? And um, I wanted to set up something uh, about Abraham, but in the process of getting there, uh, the chapter I was using was so chock full of camping places where you could just camp and chew a while that I got a real dilemma of how to do it. And uh, so I'm going to kind of run through the, uh, the woods willy-nilly and, uh, <laughs> and hit a few things. And I want to ask uh, Justin, I've, uh, forgive me for sending you a million scriptures. Um, just ignore John 8. <laughs> no problem. Unless I call it out. Because otherwise, everybody will be trying to read and we'll be here till 4 o'clock or so. So, um, but um, I was using John 8 um, and reading it and meditating on it and chewing on it. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what I wanted to share. And so I if you've ever uh, ministered you know what that's like and you realize uh, the clock's not getting bigger and Joe says well just do two parts I said well then I'd have to do part two today and part one next week I said that doesn't make any sense so because Abraham is in part two but I want to say in uh, John chapter eight it's an interesting chapter in the Bible uh, because in it uh, there's 59 verses almost 60 but right at the halfway point verse 30 uh, up until there, the Jews are on the offense, and they're aggressively accusing and challenging Jesus on every front. From there on, Jesus turns the tables, and he's challenging them. And uh, the interesting thing is, after the first half of John 8, uh, their um, efforts to undermine him and, and uh, undermine his credibility uh, were so pitiful uh, that they ended up with more Jews believing in him than they started with. At the end of the second half of John 8, the Jews who believed in him are part of the crowd that then want to stone him. And so um, it's just an interesting uh, unfolding of events that has plenty of lessons in it, but I want to start with just John Chapter 8, and the first uh, scenario is the Jew, the, the Pharisees bring Jesus, and you all know this story, the, the woman caught in adultery, she was probably set up, but she was caught in adultery, and they bring her to Jesus in order to entrap him, is he going to violate the law of Moses or, the, or Roman law? And Romans uh, didn't allow you to uh, murder, uh, uh, I guess capital murder, or, or uh, kill somebody without their permission, and so Moses said this woman needed to be stoned, and Jesus was in this situation. And uh, the interesting thing about this scenario is that Jesus, uh, you know, stooped down and wrote in the dust, and nobody knows what he wrote, possibly listing the sins of all the accusers. Some people say but it's just, you know, use your imagination what he could have written there. Uh, maybe the names of, uh, of, of women that the men who were going to stone her had already committed adultery with. Who knows? Could have written anything. But the point is, uh, what I found interesting from what I shared last week is that they began to, when he said, uh, let he who is without sin throw the first stone, they began to drift away, drop their stones, walk oh, from the oldest to the youngest. The oldest had a better perspective, had longer to live where they had seen how much they could fail. And they walked away, and, then, and uh, they all walked away. And Jesus said to the woman, where are those accusers of yours, and has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And she calls him Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he doesn't condemn her as, as her Savior. He doesn't condemn her, but as her Lord, he commands her. And he says, now go and sin no more. And so we have Jesus on uh, manifesting both his roles, and we need to get both his roles, not just Savior, but also our Lord. 
And so uh, by, in verse 13, the scene moves to the Pharisees challenging his statements about himself where he says, I am the light of the world. And uh, he, they, they begin to question him because they said, you're your own witness, and you can't have just one witness and have anything proven in a court of law, in a court of uh, secular law. Uh, you, you have to have two witnesses. Everything is confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. You all know that scripture. The, um, the responses that Jesus would give to things like this, he would say, I am one. Now, anytime Jesus said, I am, there should have been something go off in them. I am one, and the Father who sent me is two, is basically what he said. And they go, uh, th th this always blew their mind because they're, they're dealing with this guy that keeps equating himself uh, with the Father who is in heaven. And you've got to remember, these were Jews who only knew God by long-distance history lessons. He hadn't spoken to them for 400 years. They had the prophetic word that was taught to them of what God had said, and that they hadn't heard the Lord until John the Weird Baptist came along and was yelling at them to repent. We were driving down the road the other day, and I had John Kilpatrick on on a CD, and my, my granddaughter June said, Daddy, why is he screaming? <laughs> and this is probably what the Jews were going, why is he screaming at us? He was, can you imagine John doing anything but preaching when he shared things? So he was saying things to them like, Don't say you have Abraham as your father. God is able from these stones to raise up Abraham. Therefore bring forth fruit in keeping with your repentance. And they're going, well, we're depending on our biological relationship, our descendancy from Abraham. That, their pride in that kept them secure. And John came and just began to poke holes in that. And, uh, and, and you know how it worked out. They didn't receive him as being from heaven. So when Jesus came, um, you know, they said, John is, has a demon and Jesus is a wine bibber and a glutton. You know, they, all, they both got problems, serious issues. And, um, and so they, they, they didn't receive Jesus either. And that's a challenge. Uh, sometimes what you need to do now is go back and don't miss what God had for you in the past. Just say, Lord, I repent of anything that I rejected that was of you. I, when I first began to get serious about uh, stepping into what God called me to, I said, Lord, what do I need to do? And, he, and the Lord very clearly said to me, he said, you need to go back and get those Kenneth Copeland tapes that you threw away, put them up in the closet, and wasn't going to listen to them. At that time, it was cassette tapes. He said, because you're going to need what I showed him about faith to go where you're going. He didn't say I had to agree with everything he did and everything he said. He just had a, a revelation about faith that I needed. And I had to repent, change the way I think, go back and get those. And he's been a blessing to my life ever since. And I know there's people that we've kind of shelved them and said, you know, we appreciate you. And I don't know why you got such a big following, but it's not me. I'm not following and, uh, and, and yet they have something that they're carrying that if we're not careful, we'll miss God. I told the Lord one time, I said, uh, Lord, whatever Benny Hinn said in that book, Good Morning Holy Spirit, so many people getting blessed by it. I said, just do that with me. It's me and you, Lord. Me and you, Jesus. And the Lord said, uh-uh. I said, wait a minute. What do you mean you're not going to do it with me? He said, you're going to get it from Benny. Get it from his book. I said, why? And he said, because I want you to need your brother. I want you to need each other. <clears throat> you know, we don't find it so natural to walk in unity that we do it without needing each other. It helps that we recognize our need. That, as Paul said, there's life that flows in the joints. So we need that life to be flowing in our lives. So he said, I'm one with the Father, and the Father is my other witness. And they said, well... Where is your father? And he said, you do not know me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know him. And basically he's saying to them that they wouldn't recognize God if he stood in front of them and talked to them in human form because that's what he was doing. And they weren't, they weren't getting it and they weren't recognizing it. 
And the only one I know of, and I could be wrong, I didn't uh, research this really good. The only one I know of that talked to God when he was in human form and got it, didn't miss it, was Abraham. One time God came over the horizon with two angels, and they were all three as men. Came up to Abraham's tent, and Abraham recognized it was the Lord. And he said, what are, Lord, let me make you a meal. Let me wash your feet. Let me. And he just honored him, honored him, honored him. And then God, that's when God said, you know, I'm going to tell Abraham what we're going to do. And, he, and the angels were going on to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham recognized God when he came in human form. I don't know of any other uh, patriarch that did that or that was even asked to do that. But Abraham's influence with God Remember, this is before the law of Moses. This is before God told anybody how he wanted people to treat people, how he, the Ten Commandments that we have out here in our flower bed, uh, how he wanted them to relate to him. That's before he had any of that. This guy Abraham was a pagan that God said, I, I like something about that man. And here's one of the things he said about him. I think he's going to pass on to his children the way to relate to me that he does. He said he's going to direct his household after him. His descendants are going to be like him. And this guy was a pagan now. He didn't have the kind of guidance we have in the Bible. And Abraham had this, when I, as I read and studied him, some of you might stumble over this. I really, and and uh, President Trump has been <laughs> compared to Jehu and Cyrus and David and every other well now I'm going to compare him to Abraham because Abraham seemed to have confidence that he knew the art of the deal and he'd say God well you know you wouldn't destroy the whole city if there were righteous people in there too would you and God said well no he said well what if there was just 50 in there and God said well no and he said well what about 40 and God said no and he said well 30 and he keeps working him he works God, and God likes it. Because if he didn't, he'd have zapped him and went and destroyed them all anyway. But, but Abraham is very, very, Abraham's very honorable as he does it. Gets God down to ten. And then because of his relationship with God and honoring God, because there wasn't ten in those cities, God has those two angels get Lot and his family out of there. And it says they tarried so much that those angels had to, they didn't realize the danger, they didn't believe it, or they were just so um, seared by the sinfulness of the cities they lived in that they were dragging their feet. It says the angels took them each by the hand. Come on now, we got to get out of here. And literally got them out of there with angelic help so that they wouldn't be destroyed. And then we still know the story where his... Lot's wife turned and looked back against the word of the angel. Dear, would you give me that water, please? I got, yeah, that's, uh, this one's open already. Here we go. Thank you, Matt. We, we know the uh, story where uh, Lot's wife turned and looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. What a, what a judgment on somebody. But uh, at least it's useful, you know. Um, Being one who's very practical in my, in my relating to God. It's where the deer hunters all set up, didn't they, Dan? <clears throat> so, um, but, um, so Jesus said, um, in fact, in a later chapter, he said, And this is eternal life, that we may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He was praying. And he said, Father, this, he gave the definition of eternal life. Knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ, both of them uh, are important to knowing uh, to eternal life. And so, because the Jews knew neither, he said to them, uh, since you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Just right in their face. And they reacted and by basically saying, who do you think you are? This is all John chapter 8 before we get to verse 30. 
And he said, it's just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. You're not hearing me. You're not hearing my words. It's like I'm speaking another language. And he said in verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. What I hear Jesus saying right there is I'm, I'm fully human, and I have opinions. Don't we all have opinions? Don't we all have the ability to have an opinion even though we've seen all the facts? And... Um, <clears throat> The sad thing is we have the ability to have an opinion that more affects our behavior and our judgment than what we profess to believe. It, our opinions can actually contradict what we claim we believe. And they have more influence on our lifestyle than our beliefs. And so we have to, like uh, the word came this morning, open the door. I just felt like God was saying, look, give me your opinions. Let me, let me put my finger on where they're not lining up with what you say you believe. Your contradiction isn't with the Bible, it's with you. You're, you're contradicted with yourself. And, uh, and so God wants to bring reality into that situation, and that's what truth in the Scriptures, that's one of the meanings of the word truth, is it's a, it's a reality that has evidence. It's a reality that's observable. It's experiential. It's not just you saying it. He says in one place, how can a man say he loves God but hates his brother? He's a liar. Because what he's saying is not observable in how he relates. And so he says truth has reality that you can track. It has reality that you can see. But Jesus to Jesus every day was Father's Day. And he had another 24 hours to reveal the heart of the Father. And Verse 27 explains why it was so difficult for them to understand Jesus because it says they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. See, one of the roles that Jesus came in was to reveal to a people who did not know God except long distance to reveal to them the true desires of God. See, he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, I thought maybe he wanted to kill all the sinners. That's why he let the tornado hit. No. No. That's not God's desire. Jesus showed us God's desire. Now what happens is not... This sounds like heresy, but I'm telling you, God doesn't always get what He wants. You say, well, He's God. Why not? Because the way He set it up, He gave us a free will. He wants us to love Him willingly. And when we don't, there's consequences to our lifestyle. There's consequences to that. But Jesus... Every day he celebrated his Father's Day, and he said in verse 29, And he who sent me is with me, and the Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. <clears throat> you know, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the past days God has spoken to our forefathers at various times and in various ways through the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, who is his express image and the glory of his countenance. And so Jesus was the exact replica of God in all of his dealings with man. He said, I have many things to judge and say concerning you, but I speak only those things what he wants me to say. I have my opinions, but that's not what I'm saying to you. I'm saying to you his opinions. Isn't that powerful? Just, he was just an, uh, uh, what, and sometimes he wouldn't qualify it, and he'd say, tear this temple down and in three days I'll build it up again. They go, what's he talking What? What's he talking about tearing his temple? It took us 45 years to build. It's the Father speaking so clearly through the Son that he's talking about the body of Jesus. And it's, I'm not saying that we would have got it if we were standing there. Because it, it added to their, their difficulty in grasping what he was, what he was doing. So except for a very few like Simeon and Anna, these Jews, you know, apparently the Holy Spirit moved in them in a way that they, they were in the right place at the right time in the temple to see Jesus when he was brought in as a baby. So there were those that somehow had this relationship with God. But, but by and large, it looks like the Jews were just uh, challenged on every front uh, to recognize when it was the words of the Lord and and so Jesus is coming back to these challenges and these accusations and, and uh, answering them uh, with, with uh, spiritual words that were just like, phew, phew, phew. 
But somehow after uh, this, these encounters, in verse 30 it says, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. That's amazing. They're doing their level best to destroy him. And people are going, I don't know, there's something about him. Can you imagine Jesus saying some things and there's nothing about what he said you understood, but there's something about him, man. Every time he speaks, my heart burns. Every time he, he looks at me, I, I melt. What is it about? Well, what, what has to happen is somebody has to reject all of that to say he's, he's not who he says he is. Now, starting in the next half of this chapter, Jesus challenges them. And he doesn't water it down for these that said these new believers, these Jews that believed in him, he doesn't water it down for them. He doesn't make it easier on them. But he gets into cl their claims about who their daddy is. And they're touchy about that now. He said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, verse 31, you are my disciples indeed. And so he's saying in that, in that verse, the word there is logos. And it means what I have already said to you, if you take it to heart, if you apply it to your life, he said, then you are my disciples indeed or in truth. And it's the same word used in the next verse, verse 32, where it says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He said there will be a reality when you say I agree it'll manifest in something observable. <clears throat> when you say, I'm born again, you may have some issues to walk through. There may be some processes that God has to work in your life. But I know when I got born again and I was transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and my nature became a new creation in Christ and I no longer had the old nature but the new nature and I had all the old habits. You did too. But I had a new nature. And in some of those habits, there was a process of changing them, getting rid of them, getting something that agreed with God. But in some other ways, instantly, I didn't want to do that anymore. Instantly, I said, I'm not going bar hopping tonight. And I grew up Catholic. We didn't, we didn't see drinking as sin. That's what we did in the fields. It was better than the water. And, uh, and nobody, you know, and the priest drank during the Mass. You know, I was an altar boy. I poured the wine in the cup and gave it to him. I mean, he held the cup and I poured it in. Drinking was not an issue to me. And I told the lady, I said, I'm not going bar hopping tonight. She said, why not? I was one day old Christian. I said, because I'm a Christian now. And she said, well, don't Christians drink? And I said, I don't know. I really don't know. But I'm not. I'm not going. For me, it's a bad deal. At that time in my life, for me, it was a bad deal. <clears throat> Instantly, there was a change in my nature and what I wanted. For those that think they can follow Jesus without being born again, because, see, you were born a slave to sin. And if you're not born again as a slave to righteousness, as a servant of righteousness, you can't except in legalism, try to walk after Jesus. So the reality check for us is if we're really His disciples, there will be evidence. And we, here's the evidence that should be with all of us. All of us are at different stages, different levels, walk through different things. But we should be getting freer as we do the things He tells us to do. And I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. Yes, those are important. Those are something that should be the backdrop to your lifestyle. But as He tells us the things to do, we now have a Holy Spirit living within us that gets specific. And when I was trying to figure out why I had this, uh, I, was, I knew I was born again, I knew I was saved, but I'd gotten dry and I'd gotten uh, to where living a Christian life on earth wasn't that fun. You know, it was just like, okay, what can we do? We, all, all Christians can do is overeat and not get in trouble. And so I want to, I don't like this, you know, because I'm used to having fun, you know. I'm used to, uh, you know, doing everything out of beyond moderation. And so, um, Lord, uh, I know I'm saved, 
And if I can't have the kind of relationship with you that the Bible says I can have, then I want to go home tonight. That was 3 in the morning, 1988. And I said, but if I can't have the kind of relationship I see in the Bible, then whatever I have to do, I'll do. He said to me, my spiritual ears popped up, and he said, you finally prayed the whatever prayer. I said, well, I prayed that when I got saved. He said, yeah, I know, but it's different levels and degrees of surrender that you've got to walk in. Your surrender on that day needs to increase for this day. And he said to me very clearly, he said, now I want you to leave where you're at, and I want you to go do, go over here and do this. Where we were at had been 16 years in this ministry and in part of this church. I believe we had a handle on certain things and thought I would die in it. So I left, and we went to this little Assembly of God church that later uh, became uh, uh, non-denominational, but we went there and uh, led of the Lord, and the Lord would speak to me. And he'd say, this is what I want you to do. And it wasn't stuff that put me, elevated me. It was stuff that made me serve. He said, I want you to mow uh, all around that pond and that spillway. I want you to keep that up. Well, it was hot. And they had a push mower. And the spillway is an angle. And I'm out there dun -dun 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 mowing in the heat of the summer. And the pastors are driving by to play golf. And I, believe me, I took it up with the Lord, you know. This is not a scenario that's made up. And uh, one of the, the, um, our head pastor, who was a blessing to my life, he said to one of the others, he said, who's that out there mowing the spillway? And they said, that's David Hurdle. And they said, what are we paying him? And he said, uh, nothing. And he said, really? He said, they said, yeah. Uh, year after year, a couple years of that, maybe it was just a couple years, but doing things like that and being dependable to do it, when they established... Uh, pulled out of the assemblies and established an eldership uh, he made me an elder and I know I served my, my way into that place but I was also uh, teaching and things like that but, but I'm, I'm saying that don't write this thing off where you're getting freer because you do what he says that gets real dynamic it gets like give so and so twenty dollars well, Lord, that's my last $20. Are you going to get free or not? I'm telling you, He does that. And you have ears to hear. You were born again with, with ears to hear the Holy Spirit. And if you're not hearing Him, pray the whatever prayer. And then follow up with it. He told me in the middle of the church service, go get that pastor a glass of water. And I said, I've only been here two weeks. I don't even know where the kitchen is. And they're going to think I'm trying to uh, butter up to the pastor. You guys didn't know all this went on in church. Some of you have been in church a while and know it goes on. And so, uh, and the Holy Spirit said to me, I was sitting there and, and he was preaching, and the Holy Spirit said, okay. I said, what do you mean, okay? He said, I see what level you want to surrender to. I said, now don't do that. I was just, I said, don't do that to me. Argue with me. Argue me into it. He said, no, I love you. I, said, I got him, got him a glass of water, and I got met in the hallway. Uh, who do you think you are? Same thing they did to Jesus. Uh, and um, anyway, from there, I'm just, I'm just asking you, tune your ear and take it very serious what he says because you're going to walk into your freedom by doing the rhema word that's coming to you spontaneously from his voice. So uh, Jesus um, challenges them, and I want to get to this now real quickly because I want to get to Abraham. He said, uh, here's the litmus test for who's, who's your daddy. Verse 38, he said, I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you've seen with your father. And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And the last part of verse 44 says, you are of, Jesus actually takes it further and says, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Meaning they weren't devil, they weren't born of the devil like we were born of God when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, but they were of the devil by imitation. And they were imitating him, and their tendencies were the same tendencies he had was to steal, kill, and destroy. And so he challenged their, their claim that since Abraham is our ancestor, 
we're okay in all this. And he said, you've got to look at your habits. You've got to look at your actions. You've got to look at your words if you want to claim Abraham as your father. Now, this is, this is very uh, simple and, and mostly understood by the church, but uh, all through the New Testament, it made, it's made very clear that we are Abraham's children as we, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 7 says, Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. In Romans 4, 16, last part of 16, uh, and verse 17, He is the father of us all, and as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God. So, it's a, it's a natural thing. It's it, somehow in our DNA that we have expressions that are like our dad's. My wife sometimes says to me, that sounds like your dad. And I'm going, usually it's, it's things that I should have. Uh, my dad wasn't a Christian, and so, uh, except till later in life. And uh, he was a good man, and he taught me to love to work and the joy of work. But um, he had other things that he did that were peculiar to him, like you'd say, Dad, I want a new car. And he said, I'll give you a new car. And I thought, well, that's what I said, but he, t he turned it into a threat, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> Dad, I need some gas out of the tank out there. He said, I'll get you some gas. I'm going, oh, never mind, you know. <laughs> and um, so I think sometimes <laughs> that seemed to work for him. So uh, <laughs> at times it confuses them enough I can make an exit, you know. That... Uh, <laughs> So, but, but I, we were, we were, John, my son was in a play one time, and a new pastor had come to that church, and, and um, we were talking, and I said, that was my son that was acting that part, and he said, I knew it. I said, how'd you know? And he said, he walks like you, and he talks like you. And I'm going, well, okay, you know, well, I'll take that as a compliment, because I thought he was a pretty handsome young man, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's natural for us to pick up the things that our Father modeled to us and that are part of our nature. Uh, and so Jesus wants to use this as a positive thing. And, 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 and then as we know, we were, we were uh, grafted into Abraham's lineage. Then we have this natural and supernatural tendency uh, in us, in our nature, to be like Abraham. And there are things that Abraham, uh, I'm going to go through these real quick, hopefully. There are things that Abraham, as our father, um, modeled for us that we really ought to want to do. And this is men and women, but especially men today. Uh, Abraham, I got this feeling, you know, born, uh, uh, followed God as a, a coming out of a pagan lifestyle in a pagan city, in a pagan country. And God just says, I choose you. And, and I get this, as I read Abraham uh, without the religious glasses, I see a real man. I see a gruff man. I see a man who says, wait a minute. You ain't taking my nephew. Guys, mount up. 318 guys going, <laughs> whip an army. Not on my watch, you're not doing it. But then also Abraham being a real man, I think the king of Egypt may want my wife. Hey, honey, come here. Tell him you're my sister. My goodness, he's going to chop my head off to get you. you know? Just tell him you're my sister. I mean, he's, he's a real man. He's got issues. He's, he, he didn't come up in a church somewhere. He did the same thing later with the king uh, of uh, with Ambimelech. And uh, he ends up, you know, it shows his, 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 his faith was not so great and his trust in God was not so great that, that now these kings ended up blessing him giving him flocks and herds and everything and just got her out of their harem because they said, you almost made us come under the curse of God that we didn't, you know, we didn't even know about. And uh, they ended up blessing him, but it, it seems like he didn't understand the kind of favor that was on his life that he could have got that blessing without having to be deceptive. I'm not sure about that. But he, he was just a, a man's man. And uh, some of the, I'm going to just give you five things he did, and then we're going to be done. He said, 
Uh, I say he obeyed God as far as he knew God's will. You know, God called him out of, uh, uh, it says in Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham obeyed God when he was called to go out to a place he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. He left the familiar and went into the unfamiliar simply because God said to, get, to, to go. Um, we've, we've heard this statement before. I think I heard Bill Johnson say it first. He didn't know where he was going, but he knew where he couldn't stay because God said, you can't stay here anymore. Well, where am I going? You just go, and I'll, you'll know when you get there. And, uh, and he went out that way, took his family with him, and uh, went on this journey with God, took the risk and went on a journey with God. Number two, he kept God first in everything. Genesis 22.10 said he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. Whew. I believe God, uh, Abraham, you know, Jesus said of Abraham, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And I believe Abraham saw what God was going to do before he was on that mountain with his son because he said he's going to raise him from the dead anyway so this is not going to be the end all <clears throat> but when they were going up the uh, Isaac said well daddy we got the wood we got the knife we got the, and the fire but where's where's the sacrifice he said God will provide himself a sacrifice that's the way he said it. God will provide himself the sacrifice you can read it God gave himself in his only begotten son as a sacrifice and it says when Abraham raised that knife the angel of the Lord said he had already raised it up he was going through with it it wasn't just well I'm going to go along and God's going to stop me God God when are you going to stop me and he was ready to plunge it in and the angel said Abraham Abraham and he lifted up his eyes and he saw the, the ram caught in the thicket so he kept God first in everything and he the challenge we have today God doesn't settle for seconds when it's a family matter. It's awful quiet in here. When the kids have to play t-ball instead of come to church, you better be hearing God because you're teaching them, Daddy, what to model. You follow God as long as it's convenient, but when it clashes with what you really want to do. <clears throat> I'm telling you, I had to go to the coaches, and I said, look, we'll play. And John was a good athlete. We'll play, but when that tournament comes on Sunday, we'll be in church. I just want you to know that. If you make him an all-star, he can't play on Sunday. They said, okay, okay, okay. Well, they made him an all-star, and they had a tournament on Sunday. We weren't there until later in the afternoon. We went out to watch him, watch him play, and uh, it was 105 degrees, and they were all crying, and he was glad he wasn't playing. But so... <laughs> So God worked that out. <clears throat> but I'm just saying there'll be decisions you have to make, but God has to be first in everything, everything. And that's what Abraham did. Number three, he protected and interceded for his family. The flip side of that, says Genesis 14, 14, when Abram heard that Lot had been taken captive, he went in pursuit, didn't hold back. Lot had got himself in several kinds of trouble. And Abraham didn't go, well, it's about time it caught up with him. If he had done what I told him, if he wasn't so greedy, he, uh, he just said, wait a minute, he's family. I'm going after him. And so uh, he went in pursuit, and he, he gained uh, everything back, plus the, the, uh, the uh, spoils of the other kings and, you know, all that. And that's where he actually tithed to the king of Salem, who was a, a picture of Christ. <clears throat> so Abraham's tithing, honoring God before that ever comes into the law. Um, number four, he believed God in the face of hopelessness. And this is where you get into the New Testament, Romans chapter four. <clears throat> he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but by giving glory to God, he built up his faith, being fully persuaded that he who promised was well able to perform it. <clears throat> said he looked at his body. <clears throat> said it can't happen here. He looked at Sarah's body and said it can't happen there. Let's see, I'm going to look at God. He can do it. <laughs> and uh, after 100, they were, he was 99, Sarah was um, 80, 79. And uh, they conceived Isaac finally. And you know the story about how they had this little detour with Ishmael. But finally they conceived Isaac after all those years. And um, because he believed God over all the hopeless looking situations. Now here's one I want to uh, encourage you. Number five. And I ran across this as I was studying Abraham and really hadn't thought about it before. 
But Abraham had this blessing pronounced on him by God. And he relied on the ministry of angels to enforce it. I mean, he did. He worshipped God, but he acknowledged that the muscle of heaven were angels. And they would come, and they would enforce what, what God pronounced over Abraham. Let me give you an example. Abraham is on his deathbed. He's getting old. He's not going to be around much longer. He calls his servant, and he said, I want you to go back to my home country, and I want you to find a wife for my son Isaac. And I don't want you to take him back there. I don't want him to live back there. I want him to stay here. But I want you to find him a wife and, and, and take gifts and supplies and everything. But you find that girl and you bring her back. And the servant is like, he has to make this covenant with Abraham. And the covenant is that if I don't fulfill what I covenanted, then your legacy can hold me to account. They can kill me for it. And so I'm in this covenant whether you're here or not. And so he said, well, what if I can't find her? I mean, that's a, that's a big order. And Abraham says in Genesis 24, verse 7, The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Abraham said, it's not just you, buddy. You know, I appreciate your heart, and I appreciate your diligence, but it's not just you, because God's going to give me angelic help in this, and He's going to help you. And you're going to uh, see that His angel is going to uh, guide and direct and bring her and bring the situation. You all know how it played out, and Rebecca was found, came back with him, and uh, Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac says Isaac loved Rebecca when he laid eyes on her. <clears throat> Hebrews says there are, there, there are all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for us who will inherit salvation. It also says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable company of angels. That's here. That's what we've come into today. Hebrews 13 says, don't forget to entertain strangers for so, by so doing. Some have unwittingly entertained angels. They look like men at times. They look like people. They look like poor people. Who was it was telling me? Matt was telling me recently. Angel. We just believe it's an angel. If, we, if we're wrong, what can that hurt? But he had a situation where he drove. It was in the rain, wasn't it? The guy was standing there on a street corner. He had a sign, long hair, beard, had a sign that says, Smile, you're beautiful. I'm going, well, what happened to the sign that says, I'll work for food, you know, and stuff like that. But smile, you're beautiful. And so Matt drives by, and he says, I'm going to go back. He told Anna, I'm, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but uh, close as I can. He told Anna, I said, I'm going to go back and see if I can find that guy, because that's weird, him standing there with a big smile, just a glowing smile saying, smile, you're beautiful. And he goes back to find him. The guy's not there. He goes down the street. He's not there. He's not anywhere around. But it picked you up, didn't it, Matt? Ministry of angels. Hallelujah. They may walk up at you with a sign. They may look like a homeless person. But be careful because God says if you imitate Abraham, you're going to, rely, you're going to learn to rely on angels. Joe sees my, was it Lisa? Had her hand caught in the door. If you moved it one way, it crushed it. If you moved it the other way, it crushed it. Jesus, send your angel. Popped it right out. No problem. When she was a, that wasn't yesterday, was it, Lisa? That was like when you were four. <laughs> I had to pick on her a little bit. Um, Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word. Worship team, come up. Heed in the voice of his word. says they're, they're let, waiting for this to be heard. If I took this and I held it up to the microphone, it wouldn't move a mountain, wouldn't save a soul, wouldn't do anything. Angels, armies of angels are standing at attention. And I'm holding this up. I said, well, I believe the Bible. Hallelujah. I believe the Bible's the Word of God. He says, man, I wish you'd just tell me. 
by his stripes I'm healed. We get to work, man. I wish he'd just tell me that by the cross he's overcome the wicked one. I'd go after that guy. And they're standing waiting like a dog that somebody threw a stick, but he's not going to go until he's, he's got the voice of his word. See, he says you've got to give voice to this. You've got to give voice to what he's put in your heart, to what he's saying to you that, that agrees with this. Why don't you stand? And I'm telling you dads today, you have got a responsibility that is frightening without angelic help. You got the Holy Spirit living in you to help you know what to voice. But if you'll voice it, you've got the written word. If you'll voice it, there's angels that are going to go where you can't go with your kids. Bill, he's gone off to college. You ain't going to be there. You can send an angel. Ha! Brent, you thought you were going to get away with a lot of stuff. You ain't getting away with nothing because there's an angel involved. How many people have been delivered, saved uh, uh, from accidents, from doing the wrong thing by angels, and we haven't even realized it. But we can send those. You can send those after your son in the military. You can send them to guard him. Story after story of how angels have guarded military people. But fathers, imitate Abraham and rely on the help of angels. Rely on the ministry of angels. We don't worship them. But we acknowledge that God gave them to us to help enforce His blessing on our life. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the word this morning that gives us the word to speak. And we release the angels that were sent to make this church grow and be healthy and thrive. And we release the angels that are doing battle against the virus and the contaminants and the, the contag contagiousness of it. We release the angels that are doing battle on behalf of this nation to uh, cause the divisions and the anarchy and the, the pain of the past, all of that, they're helping to minister and to change it because this nation has a destiny that can only be fulfilled with the help of angels. So we imitate angels. We imitate Abraham and we rely on the angels, Lord. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for your love. And we thank you that you've made provision and that there's angels available to make sure your blessing is enforced on our lives. In Jesus' name, and you all agreed and said amen. Amen. God bless you. If you need prayer after the